perfectionist when it comes to presentations because I am a, um, the title that I came up with for myself is Digital Storyteller. Uh, and um, that is basically a way of describing, um, you know, doing creative writing or creative storytelling through video, through, um, through social media, through social media marketing. I'm going to try to do several things at once. I'm going to be awesome at all of them. And uh, part of that comes from my background. Um, I am from, I'm a proud Temple University owl. Uh, yay! Let's see, I graduated from uh, Temple's film program in, God help us and save us, 2007. So I've been an adult for all these years, so it's just, it's really, really weird. Uh, how do I connect to this guy here? It's a, I'm looking at you, Fred, I'm looking at you. <laughs> I should be looking at this guy, okay. I'll keep happy as saying as we're, as we're trying to get this connected. So I graduated from Temple in 2007 and I uh, didn't want to move to Los Angeles, didn't want to move to New York City to pursue film. So I decided to stay in Philly and unfortunately there were no film jobs here, which was kind of rough, HDMI. Uh, so in the year since, I've been doing um, communications in uh, nonprofits in order to make ends meet, and I'm kind of an accidental nonprofit communicator, but I've loved every minute of it. And that ties into what I'm going to talk about tonight, because one of the nonprofits that I worked for was Women Against Abuse. Thank you. <laughs> I don't even know your name, but I think you're awesome. Marta. I'm Jeremy. Jeremy. I was like, you're Marta too? That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> okay. Like a Marta every day does it. It really doesn't. You don't get to meet another Marta every day. Yeah. Well, actually, my birth name is Margaret, but I liked the name Marta because I thought Marta Rustic sounded really cool on a marquee, and since I thought I was going to be the next Steven Spielberg, it made a little bit more sense. Uh, now I'm the Steven Spielberg of nonprofit communications, and it's amazing. So uh, I worked for Women Against Abuse as a part time uh, communications and administrative associate in 2016 until mid 2017. Uh, then I got promoted to a full-time position at the Quaker organization that I work at, and Women Against Abuse liked my work so much, they said, how would you like to do consulting work for us? And I said, hell yeah. So in the time that I've worked for Women Against Abuse, um, it's, it's been a really fascinating education on what does, what does having a safer society really mean, what do safe relationships really mean, and what constitutes abuse? Because I thought abuse was simply physical violence between two people, when it turns out there is a much larger continuum of violence. And uh, one area where there is a pretty significant problem with um, abuse being portrayed as something that's either normal or highly romantic and desirable is pop culture. So um, even though abuse is a terrible thing and we really need to work towards getting rid of it, What's been fascinating working for Women Against Abuse, both as an employee, as a contractor, is seeing that overlap between the thing I went to school for, filmmaking, and the thing that I'm really passionate about now, which is creating safer communities and making sure people know about their relationship rights. So for my lightning talk tonight, um, we're going to talk real quick about abuse as romance in pop culture. Uh, I also chose this topic because Valentine's Day is coming up, and since I just got my cable hooked up today, I have no doubt that I'm going to be seeing a lot of romance movies on rotation, and since we all have to go through that together, I thought we could talk about some stuff. So, what is abuse? Uh, you'll notice up here, I'm not going to read all of these, but I think it's important if we're going to talk about well, what is abusive behavior, it's important to know well, what exactly are we referring to. So, as I was mentioning, the only abuse that I was aware of um, was physical abuse, so actually physically assaulting somebody. Um, another big problem within physical abuse is strangulation and damaging personal property. I, we don't think about personal property as a form of physical violence, but it is, especially if it's against your car, which is something you might need to get to work, and if a partner destroys your tires, takes the carburetor out of your car, anything like that, um, you're now not able to get to work. So it is a massive interference and disruption in your personal life. 
Emotional is one that doesn't get nearly enough attention, but is one of the most damaging things that um, you can imagine within an abusive relationship. It's not just name calling, but it's the idea of if you're with your partner and they're putting you down all the time in front of other people, um, isolating you from your loved ones, so saying, you know, I don't think your friends really like me, I don't want to hang out with them anymore. The idea being that if you can't talk to your friends and get that feedback from them where they're saying, this person seems to have an awful lot of control over you and that bothers me a lot, I'd like to talk with you about that. When your loved ones are no longer around you or in close proximity or able to even communicate with you, that is a huge risk for the person who's in an abusive situation. And then of course there's stalking, and um, the thing to understand about stalking is that it's not, it's not restricted to any particular gender. Women can stalk men, men can be stalked by women, people outside of the gender binary can stalk and be stalked. And unfortunately, people who are transgender are the most disproportionately affected by domestic violence right now. They're more likely to be murdered, they're more likely to be stalked, and they're also less likely to be able to get um, the crime that's been committed against them resolved because of um, sexism and transphobia against people who are transgender. One emerging form of abuse that I think everybody should be more aware of in addition to emotional abuse is technological abuse. And it's not just necessarily you know, stalking somebody on Facebook, which is a phrase I very much like to see go away because there's nothing cute about stalking. Uh, it can be hacking into somebody's accounts. It can be saying, well, you know, if we're going to be a couple, I need to have access to all of your personal accounts, which is unfortunately a lot more common than people realize. Um, there are also tracking devices that you can put in somebody's car, you can put in somebody's phone, you can really follow people around, which the weird thing is we see that a lot of parents will install programs on their children's phone and say, but I want to know where you are. And while I understand that desire, I think the more important thing to consider is, well, why can't you have open communication with your child and encourage them to let you know you know, I'm not going to be up in your business all the time. I want to know where you are so that if the worst happens, I know how to get help for you. I know how to tell the police where I last heard from you from, and we're able to get a quick resolution and making sure that you're safe. And then last, but um, one of the more well-known forms of abuse is sexual abuse. Um, I'll be transparent and say that I am a childhood survivor of sexual abuse and it is something that does stay with you throughout your whole life. Uh, and the important thing to know about sexual abuse is that it has nothing to do with sex. Uh, it is all about having control. And that control can mean you're forcing someone to have sex with other people, which is known as human trafficking. Um, there is something called stealthing, which is when a condom is removed prior to a sexual act without getting consent from the other person. Uh, that is a form of sexual abuse, and it's another thing that's on the rise that really shouldn't be. Um, hurting somebody physically during sex, or um, you know, a form of stealthing, um, so you know, sabotaging birth control. Uh, and another unfortunate thing, like stalking, is not restricted to any particular gender. You know, a woman can sabotage a condom if she wants to get pregnant and entrap somebody in a relationship with them, which is a form of abuse, so on and so forth. Does anyone have any questions about some of the um, more unfortunate details we've just talked about? Okay. And by the way, um, I, that's something important I forgot to do. If um, anybody feels uncomfortable or needs to leave the room, we're not going to be seeing scenes or going in depth, but if you start to feel like you're a little bit uncomfortable and you don't want to be in the room hearing about this stuff, I will not be offended if you want to take a step out into the hallway to regroup. So now that we know what abuse is, let's take a look at the thing we're actually going to talk about tonight. What is romance? So these are some of you know quick definitions I got offline. You know, feeling of excitement and mystery. So it's something that you don't know about it yet, something that's new and something you haven't felt before, and now you feel alive and you want to have more of it. It's exciting. But what's interesting is that romance in movies happens really, really fast. I know for me, um, it's a gradual seduction. I, it takes like months before I want to go out on a date with somebody that I've been interested in for a long time. But if I was in a movie, I probably would have you know, had a first kiss, had sex with them within 30 minutes. Like all these other unrealistic 
uh, expectations about, well, what is romance? What is appropriate sexual interaction? What is love? And Hollywood, you know, for the sake of time, we have only 90 minutes to get to know these folks and understand what's the conflict, how's it gonna get resolved, is everybody gonna end up happily ever after? Nine times out of 10 in romantic comedies or romance movies, the guy gets the girl, the girl gets with the guy, everybody's happy. So a couple of examples I wanna go over of uh, times when romance has been portrayed, or I'm sorry, abuse has been portrayed as romance. One major offender that comes to mind for me is the Twilight Saga. Um, it should be mentioned that um, Twilight Saga went on to inspire Fifty Shades of Grey, which um, is affectionately known as mommy porn. It was a series about a, a billionaire who falls in love with a girl, and there's a contract, and there's BDSM, and what's interesting is that um, the BDSM community is really big on consent, and there's a lot of ideas being put forth in Fifty Shades of Grey that do not even mention consent. So just a spoiler, if someone is ever saying to you, I really like you, but I'm gonna need you to sign a contract so I could do really freaky sexual stuff with you, back away as quickly as you possibly can because love is not about having a contract, it's about consent, which is an ongoing process. The idea with consent is that you don't give it once and that's a blanket statement that covers all future sexual interactions. It's the idea of, I'm having a really good time. Are you having a really good time? I wanna try something new tonight. Do you wanna try something new tonight? It can even be something as simple as, does that feel good? And if the answer at any time is not really or something negative, you stop immediately. That's just the basic idea of consent. But getting back to Twilight, in Twilight, Edward, who's um, uh, Robert Pattison, uh, is seducing um, Kristen Stewart's character. And basically, he's a vampire, she's not. And vampires are normally like blood-sucking, mysterious, you know, mystery going back into romance. They're these mysterious beings that are portrayed as sexually desirable. Unfortunately, in Twilight, that's taken to a really creepy extreme. Um, at one point, Edward Bella, I, can't, I was having a, a brain fart where I couldn't remember Kristen Stewart's character's name. Uh, there's one scene where um, Edward, the uh, hunky vampire, takes the, um, the carburetor out of Bella's car so that she can't go anywhere. He's worried about her safety so much that he disables her car so that she can't make a getaway. Also doesn't tell her before, she, before he does that, which is also really, really, really problematic. Um, there are times where he breaks into her house and watches her sleep. That should not be considered romantic in real life or in movies, but there you go. Um, there's many instances where he isolates her from her best friend Jacob, and um, I actually was always on Team Jacob, just to be totally transparent. Uh, so this is definitely not a healthy relationship. Unfortunately, um, there are you know girls as young as 13 and 14 who read this series and think, well, that's what I want to aspire to. That's the kind of relationship I want, and we should really be saying, well, let's take a look at some of Edward's behaviors. If somebody did that to you in real life, would you still think that's romantic? Or would you think that that's really scary? Uh, because I think that that's the thing that we want to have the takeaway be from this relationship is this is not love, this is somebody controlling someone else. And when it comes to abuse and control, there can, it cannot be a loving relationship because in a loving relationship, you have equal footing and there's equal decision making and there is a fearlessness when it comes to disagreements. When you have an unhealthy relationship, you have somebody maintaining control and exerting power over another individual. So it's not equal, it's unequal. Uh, another notorious offender when it comes to abuse being passed off as romance is The Notebook. And uh, I'll admit, when I first saw this movie, I thought it was really cute. Uh, Ryan Gosling is a delightful love interest. Uh, there's a scene where he's um, trying to get um, Rachel McAdams' character to go out with him, and it involves a Ferris wheel. Uh, she says, well, no, I'm here with some friends, don't really wanna go out with you. And rather than say, hey girl, that's cool, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go. Just like that wonderful meme of him where he says, hey girl. It's like, bring back that hey girl, Ryan Gosling, because that's what we all came here for. But no, instead of saying, hey girl, I want to assert your right to say no, 
Um, he dangles himself from a Ferris wheel and is like, will you go out with me now? Like, I'm dangling myself for you. So somebody threatening to hurt themselves in order to get you to do something is not love. That is a massive form of abuse and emotional manipulation. So she says yes, and then we have what follows to be a deep, passionate love story, but yet still it came from an instance where a guy was dangling off a Ferris wheel in order to get this girl to go out with him. And then there are moments where there is playful, you know, bantering or argument where they're like shoving each other and she slaps him at one point. And uh, that's also a big red flag because when you have disagreements, they shouldn't be drag out, knock out fights. It should just be, hey, listen, there's been a boundary violation here. I, you know, don't, I don't agree with you in any of these things and we need to work this out, but it should never get visible. And then the last thing, which is portrayed as hugely romantic, but is also a major sign that this person is really controlling. He writes letters to her every day for a year without hearing from her. Now, I mean, there's a little bit of a wrinkle in there where her parents interfere and they keep all the letters and say, you know, we didn't think he was good enough for you, so we took your letters from you, which is also a form of abuse. But the fact is, if somebody is communicating with another person and they're not getting anything back and they're not realizing, I haven't heard anything from this person, I should interpret that as they are not interested and don't want to be bothered. His character instead decides, I'm going to just be persistent. I'm going to keep writing, and that will win her over. Uh, love is about respecting somebody else's boundaries. So even if it really sucks, and even if you really think you have a shot with somebody else, do not do what Ryan Gosling does in the notebook and write someone a text every day or 100 texts every day for a year um, until they get in touch with you. Assume that person does not want to be engaged. I'm going to back away slowly and go find somebody else. And this one hurts a lot because this is one of my all-time favorite movies. But uh, can anyone tell me what some of the problems might be with Sleepless in Seattle? And as a former Apple employee, I have been trained to deal with awkward silence. So we're good. <laughs> Sweet cheese. <laughs> Well, first off, has anyone here seen Sleepless in Seattle? Oh, read, read. I told you a while ago. A while ago, okay. Well, let's um, let's break it down a little bit. What are some of the things that happened in Sleepless in Seattle? We have a dad who's on a call-in radio show. Women from across the country write him letters saying, "I think you're great, Sleepless in Seattle. I want to get to know you better." Those were their actual voices, too, actually. Uh, but what happens after that? We have one particular woman who is really touched by this story, and rather than say, that's a cool story, I'm going to bring some of that romance into my own relationship with Bill Pullman, who is the best on-screen boyfriend ever, so I don't understand why she didn't pick him. But uh, does anyone remember some of the behaviors that Meg Ryan's character portrayed after you know, kind of falling in love for Tom Hanks' character? Yes, thank you, Babs. Yes. And that's the part where it hurts because it's a cute movie up until um, Meg Ryan's character hires a private investigator to go find this dad and his son, which is also another layer of really creepy, uh, to find the family, find out where they live, so she can go out there and pretend to meet them by happenstance rather than just leave it at a letter, let him you know, be the agent to say, yes, I want to get to know you better and I want to meet you on the Empire State Building or no, not really, sis. So that was the biggest thing for me that really uh, turned the movie into a dark area. It's still a wonderful movie and there are still moments about it that I really love, but the stalking angle is something that I think is really problematic for this movie and it should be called out for what it is, which is stalking. And unfortunately, these uh, particular um, strategies of abuse as romance are found in other movies I really love, like Revenge of the Nerds. Anyone else here love Revenge of the Nerds as much as I do? Yes. Babs, you're my spirit animal tonight. It's going to be great. Yeah. So Revenge of the Nerds, I actually watched it the day that I moved into my freshman dorm at Temple, so it has an extra special place in my heart. This is from a particular scene where um, there's the popular um, fraternities and sororities. There's a girl at one sorority who is dating the football star who is super hunky and handsome. 
in the main fraternity. And uh, she basically asks her boyfriend, you know, hey, do you want to hook up later? And he's like, no, babe, I can't. I got to do some things. One of the nerds overhears their little conversation, steals her boyfriend's um, costume, which is Darth Vader, puts it on, and then says, like, you know, implies that, hey, I'm your boyfriend. Let's go to the moon part of the park and have sex, which is what happens. And uh, it, since it's a Hollywood movie, after she has sex with this person who is clearly not her boyfriend, he pulls off the mask and reveals, I'm a, it's, it's not your boyfriend, I'm a nerd. And rather than say, holy crap, I just had sex with somebody who is not my boyfriend, she goes, you were great. Thereby erasing you know, this manipulative situation where this person you know, got into her pants under, a, um, under the identity of somebody that she wasn't expecting. So not quite rape, but um, the laws are starting to catch up with different forms of coercion when it comes to sex, and it really comes dangerously close to the line of reproductive or sexual coercion. So yeah, for, don't pretend to be somebody else's boyfriend to get the girl that you really like. Just ask her if she says no, you go find somebody else who thinks you're the most awesome person ever. And then last one that's a pretty significant offender for me, even though it's a really good movie, is um, 16 Candles. Uh, this is a scene where a character you know, is basically telling his friend, I need you to drive this girl home. She's really drunk, so my man, do whatever you feel like you need to do to her. Which is really cringe-inducing right now. Unfortunately, there are quite a few instances in these um, teen romantic comedies from the 80s that are really problematic now. And part of the reason why I think we have some of these stories which are are just like really astounding now is because there weren't many women in the writers' rooms. It's entirely possible that if there had been more directors like Amy Hepperling in there to say, you know, as somebody who could have been that girl, I think we might want to rethink how we do this scene, or we might want to think about making something else the butt of the joke instead of making rape, or date rape in this case, something that's really funny. So now that we are aware that there are movies out there that have really big problems with promoting abuse as romance, what is it that we should do? One thing that society would think that we should do is, well, we should just throw out all the bad movies. Anything that has a problem with it, let's, let's just pretend it's not there, let's stop airing it on TV, let's stop showing reruns of that show, let's just pretend it never existed. Here's my answer to that. No, we should not do that. Yes, there are movies that have problematic aspects to them. Yes, there are movies out there starring people who are now currently on trial for doing really crummy things to other people, some of them underage. But if we just say, well, we're just going to throw out the whole movie or throw out this whole canon of movies and pretend they didn't happen, what's to stop somebody else from making those same errors in uh, editorial judgment again? If you don't realize that there's something out there that could potentially cause a lot of people pain because they have lived that experience, or if there are people out there who are just like, you know, really uncomfortable by a portrayal of a particular storyline or romance, it's important to have these pieces out there so that people can see them. And it's also important not to shame somebody for their decisions in what they like. I think what's important is if you get into a conversation with someone who says, Sleepless in Seattle, that's my all-time favorite movie. Ew, you really like that movie? I mean, she stalks him. Well, yeah, I totally acknowledge that there are problematic elements of it, and I do think stalking is wrong. There are still other things about this movie that I really like, and I really appreciate you telling me about what it is that you find really, really problematic about that. And I mean that in all sincerity. If you talk to somebody who is really turned off by a movie choice that you just said, holy crap, I love that movie so much. Dismissing them or saying, well, you just don't know what good movies are, or I don't believe that person is capable of that crime that they're now on trial for, it diminishes the experiences of survivors and people who have lived some of these abuse as romance storylines in real life. So I think it is important that we take ownership of these are performances, these are not instruction manuals on how to do dates in real life, just like pornography and theater performances are not real life. They are performances that are meant to elicit a very specific emotion and reaction from you, but they're not meant to be in place of things that happen in real life. And that's my spiel of abuse portrayed as romance in pop culture.
Does anybody have any questions for me? Or other examples that they would like to lift up before we go to Rana? Who is, she'll be back, okay. She's coming back, guys, she's coming back. Anything? Yes. Uh, the very top one for me uh, would be uh, directors uh, who I really yeah. love. Uh, 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 love the things that they have done. And with them, it's a combination of other things that they did, and <coughs> product for Roman Polanski? He's exhibit A, obviously. Yeah. It is kind of down as just a great Oh, great, totally. Great movie. Uh, yeah. So and I, I watch it with this tug. And I wish I didn't have the up there, but he was yeah. responsible for that, not, you know, not me. Sure. Have you seen uh, Nanette on uh, Netflix? No. It's an amazing, amazing performance by Hannah Gadsby, who is a comedian on the autism spectrum. Um, she basically, it starts out as a comedic routine, and then it evolves into this, um, this wonderful, powerful perspective on artists and how much of the artist can you really separate from art? And she, you know, shines that inflection on herself, but she also shines that um, that perspective on people like Picasso, who had a 17-year-old muse who was impressionable and taken advantage of by somebody that was several decades older than her, and then said, "But this is this is my muse. Like, how do you how do you take this away from me?" And it's the idea that. Um, if we if we empower the artist, then they keep doing some of the behaviors that they're doing, but yet we still really love the art. So again, I don't think it's wrong. Like I love um, American Beauty still, and there's a lot of other Kevin Spacey movies that were really important in my development as a storyteller. And I'm not going to get rid of them anytime soon out of my life, but I am going to watch them with a little bit more understanding of well, how did it get to this point? Um, because when I was living in um, Jersey City and working in New York City, I heard a story from a friend who was an actor who worked with somebody who was in London who witnessed Kevin Spacey's predatory behavior towards underage actors. And I had a hard time believing it, even though this was not somebody I had any reason to doubt. I still was just like, he's a celebrity, he's a nice guy. And we do conflate that idea of just because I know them by watching their movies, somehow I know them and somehow I know that they're not capable of these really crummy things that they did to other people. So I think we're reconciling that part of it too. How much of somebody do we really know? <laughs>